Okay, brilliant. That's um, that's us started. Uh, cool. Another interview, another exclusive interview for everyone from the Fruit Fest community and uh, my YouTube channel as well and everything else. We have Ted Carr, speaking to Ted Carr again. And Ted came to the Fruit Festival in the UK last year from all the way from I Vancouver, know, Canada. Yeah, well, I don't know if you were living in Hawaii last year or was it Hawaii you were in last year this, uh, before the festival? Or you were in Canada before the festival? I was in Canada before, before yeah. yeah. And you came all the way to the UK. That's um, right. Never been here before, I don't think. No, oh, my first time in London. I absolutely loved it. Highly rate it. <laughs> And uh, came to the fruit festival for the first time as well, and played a big part in it. And uh, I think you gave three talks, and mm -hmm. uh, played a big. I'm part a fan, dude. I'm a fan. It was an amazing festival. It went well. It certainly went well. Um, so, you, are you looking forward to coming back? Yeah, man. It's like if I didn't, I only do what I'm really excited to do in life. I only do what I'm really looking forward to do, and uh, there's no way I'd fly across the world and waste my time doing anything that I don't want to do. This festival is like, I will go out of my way for this festival, man. I'll do whatever it takes to get to this festival. Great. 100%. Fantastic. It's worth, it's worth, like when I was at the festival last year, I spoke with Ann Osborne, and I was like, Ann, everything I do all year long is to prepare me and to allow me to get to these events and to experience what I'm experiencing here at this event. Like I live for these events. That's when I'm at the event. Yeah, I mean, that's there. something that you said to me actually years ago before probably the festival before my festival's on um but you want this to kind of be something where it's a year round <laughs> you want it to be yeah. like a year round festival experience there should be festivals every weekend dude all around the world and you can Definitely. be the one of the main star attractions Nah, dude everyone's like when when you're at the festival you're like hey there's so and so from youtube there's so and so from youtube there's like my idol there's that guru but then like all around you, there's these other up and coming all stars and all these up and coming like best friends and people you you really want to get to know a bit more and like you know really cute girls, really handsome boys, really like attractive athletes, really like knowledgeable people that you want to engage with that you've never even seen on YouTube before or anywhere else. They don't have a book, they don't have a YouTube channel, but they've got this aura, they've got this vibe, they've got this essence about them that you just, you're attracted to and you wanna you wanna meet. You're like who's that person, man? Um, I love it too. And, I think they're special. Yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. Mm, it's special. Now this whole this things have changed for you this year. There's a lot of things, but there's so many questions to ask. Um, but one thing I want to ask you about that I think some people will be interested in is you've obviously lived in Thailand, you've lived in Hawaii, you seem to travel, live in a lot of places. What are the benefits? What are the drawbacks in some of these different sure. places? Sure. Sure, well, I'll compare the two. I'll compare Hawaii and Thailand really quickly. And more specifically, I'll compare Hilo, Hawaii, where I am now, and Chiang Mai, Thailand, where I spent the past couple of years. Okay. Pretty much, pretty much full time. So, so for starting with Chiang Mai, Thailand, that's like a big, uh, it's a big place where everyone goes. All tons of vegans go. I remember watching years ago, you and Connor and Jake were in Chiang Mai, Thailand. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> and. And uh, it's it's where it's like the, the Thai fruit festival is, and uh, it's really cheap, really affordable. The fruit is great, the weather is great, um, really friendly locals, and um, really easy to get a one year visa there. Like everything about it is just really easy to just sure. get there, stay there, and live on the cheap. And it's if you go to if you go to nomadlist.com or like this digital nomad website, one of the top digital nomad sites. It, it ranks the best places in the world to live as a digital nomad. Uh -huh. And Chiang Mai is number one. Seriously? It's just, yeah, it's number one because it's got great, it's got great everything, dude. Great weather, great fruit, great accommodation, cheap, cheap, cheap everything, and good Wi Fi, good enough, good enough Wi Fi. Uh, so Chiang Mai is great for that. Um, as, those are the pros. As far as the cons, um, the government is a bit shady. You know, there's some, there's some shady <laughs> stuff going on. Um, you can pay people off or other people can pay other people off. The roads are quite dangerous. The air pollution is horrible. And you're surrounded by people who don't have that much money, you know? Right. And as social creatures, we justify how we are by the people around us. And if we're constantly hanging around people who don't have much money, 
then it's going to be hard for us to, to, to make more money as well. So, you know, if you want to fly with the Eagles, you got to hang with the Eagles. You can't be hanging with the chickens. So, in Hawaii now, moving over to Hawaii, there's way more Eagles here that I've, I found. Way more people who are into making more money, into delivering like great value in the world. Um, and uh, the air is cleaner here in Hawaii. The fruit is just as good in Hawaii as it is in Thailand. Maybe even better. I really love the fruit here. Um, the prices for fruit are pretty much equal. Same price for fruit in Hawaii as same price in Thailand. Uh, accommodation definitely costs a bit more in Hawaii. But uh, you're in America. You know the government's a bit yeah. more stable, a bit more trustworthy. Uh, the American dollar's there. Um, Amazon shipments come quickly. You know, within just a few days, where in Thailand it could take weeks or never show up at all. Um, you got great clean ocean here, swimming in the ocean every day, and just in Thailand there's like a massive network of vegans, but in Hawaii there's like this tight knit family of vegans and raw vegans. Like everyone, everyone really um, connects deeply, and like the word love gets thrown around a lot more here in Hawaii than it did in Chiang Mai. In Chiang Mai it's like, oh, I know that person, I know that person, I know him or her. In Hawaii it's like, oh, I love this person, I love him or her, blah, blah, blah. Like, it's just much more community knit, tight, tighter knit. So that's my comparison right there of the two. I love Hawaii and I think I'll be here a lot longer than I was in Thailand. Great, no, that's, that's, that's really interesting. Um, been to Chiang Mai myself a little bit, but that's it's a lot more information there for people and a lot of good points, I think, as well. Yeah. The other thing I think has changed for you that I've been watching a little bit this year is you're not doing triathlon anymore, or you're not mm. training for triathlon. So when I the first time I ever came across you was a tri was a a video that was you training for a triathlon mm. years ago. I remember before, that one. Before you really committed to doing a lot of YouTube videos and stuff. Um, so what's happened there? Uh, what's your, what's been your changes? And you seem to sure. you change your diet as well. I don't know exactly, but talk a bit more about that. Yeah, I'll talk about my change in triathlon. Um, so triathlon was my life. It was my identity. It was where I put all my money, all my time, all my energy, all my focus. I set goals for triathlon. I visualized triathlon. I made videos about triathlon. I would do whatever it take. I did whatever it takes to get to the race, healthy, fit, ready to win. And uh, I... Uh, I trained and trained and trained for the goal of, of winning races and win races I did. I won a few races. I earned some prize money. I achieved my goals. I raced everything from sprint distance, which is a short distance, all the way up to Ironman, which is the full you know, 10 hour, 11 hour event. For some people it takes 17 hours. Um, so I raced various distances. It was my entire life. And then a few things started happening. I got more into um, YouTube. I wanted to connect more with people, and I, I really felt like I was delivering value by expressing my thoughts and my ideas on YouTube, getting back all this good feedback from people in the comments and private messages and phone calls and emails, people saying, oh my god, thank you, you changed my life, because of all this content you're putting out. I never once really got that from triathlon. No one ever said, oh my god, because you're a triathlete, now I'm a triathlete, but all the time I'm like, oh, you get people saying, oh, because you're vegan, I'm vegan, and because you're raw vegan, I'm raw vegan, because you're fruitarian, I'm fruitarian. So I knew it was really affecting people way more with my my my, uh, my my activism I guess on online with YouTube and I love creating content I love expressing myself creatively it doesn't feel like much effort expressing myself it's just it flows but with triathlon it was a constant effort having to get into the pool having to get on the bike having to having to put in all these hard yards you know with yeah. the running with the swimming with the biking the weightlifting and it was all for what it was like to win races like just to beat other people it's like I already did that. I already, I already know I can do it, and I already did it a couple times. And I'm like, I don't really need to do it anymore. I've already proven it to myself and others that I can do it. Um, so what's it all for? And then I, you know, I just started wanting more energy and time and focus into my creative pursuits. So I just figured, you know, I want to stop competing and I want to put that energy in towards creating. I don't want to have to beat others to feel fulfilled. I don't want others to have to lose in order for me to win. So I started making these videos, and I put them on every video I upload, it's a win. I'm like, yeah, man, I uploaded that video, it's a great video, I'm getting good feedback on it. I don't really care about the feedback I get on my videos, because I'm like, I'm happy with it. Um, any feedback just carry on top, I guess. Um, and I love the relaxed vibe of being a filmmaker now. There's no stress, no pressure, really. Um, whereas traveling, there's so much pressure, like pressure I put on myself, I guess, to, to make sure I win or do well. And uh, 
Yeah, yeah. I'd rather be fit enough to be healthy. I'd rather be fit enough to be healthy than to be so fit that I'm unhealthy. Because those are two completely different paths in life. You can be extremely healthy or you can be extremely fit. But I don't think you can be both. I don't think you can be extremely fit and extremely healthy because there's a tipping point. You become too fit and then your, your health starts to decline. But at least your performance goes up. You know, sure. Some of the, the fittest athletes in the world can drop dead of a heart attack like that. Sure. You know, like Their hearts just ripped apart and they're taking EPO, they're taking so much caffeine, stimulants, all these things. Um, and they just don't they just don't have that longevity. I'm in this for longevity. I've always wanted to live over the age of 100. When I was a young kid, I was like, well, I wonder what book I need to find in this library to read to unlock the secret to live over at the age of 100. And I found it in Ann Osborne's book. I found it in 801010. Now I found it all across YouTube, How to Be 100 and Plus, you know, the Blue Zone Project. There's a few key things you got to do to be over 100. And one of the things you got to do to be over 100 is to move naturally and carefree and in a relaxed manner. You don't need to stress yourself out and go hardcore all the time. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I'm in this for the health. I just want to be healthy. That's like one of the number one priorities in my life. Fitness is just like, I want to be fit enough. I want to feel fit. I want to look fit. I want to, you know, inspire people to, to get fitter as well. But I don't need to be the fittest man in the world to do that. I'm now realizing. So I've got, on, got a triathlon and gotten into filmmaking. Has that, has your uh, change being influenced at all by your year of meditation practice, do you think? Hmm. Um, Is that I, do, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't. Did it take no, any competitive I, opinion? Or? I would say no. I would say the thing that changed the most, honestly, the thing that created the biggest shift in perception for me was listening to this audio recording by this guy named Alfie Cohn. Alfie Cohn. And he's got this YouTube clip, it's like an hour long, it's just audio, and it's called The Case Against Competition. Mm -hmm. And he just breaks it down and, and, and just like talks about how competition, we, we don't get the best out of ourselves in competition, we get the best out of ourselves when we're in cooperation. So when you're cooperating, when you're, when you're, when you're creating with other people, you're going to achieve much greater results than if you're trying to compete with people. And I agreed with every single point he made, and yet I was still competing. Like, why am I trying to beat other people when I want to live, like, the happiest, most joyous, most fulfilled life ever? If I want to live the happiest, most fulfilled life ever, I want to cooperate, I want to, I want to create, not compete. And so just hearing this audio from him, it totally resonated in the same way that understanding that humans are forgivous animals, therefore we should eat fruit. When you understand that humans are forgivous animals and that we should eat fruit, and then you go and eat other food, you're constantly feeling a bit like, what am I doing, man? <laughs> well, why am I living up to what I know can be, is the best? So when, same thing when I heard that tape, that, that competition tape, I was like, why am I still competing? I know that there's better things out there. I can cooperate. I can create with people rather than compete. So I don't think it was meditation that, that swayed me from it. Sure. But I think, I think uh, you know, meditation allowed me to be more at peace with myself when I did leave triathlon. Right. Because let me tell you, man, when I left triathlon, my self-image – was was in was in uh, was in cahoots. It was in it was a I was a wreck. I was like, who am I? I'm not a triathlete anymore. Like, what am I? Who am I? And I just just sitting in meditation, I'm just being okay with 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 uh, losing that identity, I guess, and just being okay with being still and just being a human being. Man. So meditation helped help the recovery definitely. Fantastic. And. Uh... What what have you been doing in, in its place? You seem to have been doing some weightlifting and stuff like that. Is there any kind of yeah. goal around that? I don't have as many objective goals with weightlifting as I had with triathlon. Uh, my my aim, I'll say, because goals I think are very specific. I think you should be very objective with your goals. But my aim, my desire with weightlifting – is just to continue feeling good, continue improving slightly. Every time I go to the gym, make slight improvements. And just to continue to feel good in my body, to feel good with whatever reflection is facing me back in the mirror. And you'll find that when you start working out and you're feeling good about the results that you're getting, the progress you're making, it doesn't matter what other people see in the reflection of the mirror when they, when they see you. All that matters is how you feel. And when I do weightlifting, when I do some cardio, when, I, when I'm in the gym, you know, three, four, five times a week, I feel good about the reflection in the mirror. I feel good about taking my shirt off. 
Um, so that's important to me, just feeling good about this physical body that, sure. that I have. Um, and it's just, it's just I, and another thing I want to do is just show people that you don't need to be a skinny fraternian. There are enough skinny fraternians. I was a skinny fraternian. I was 125 pounds. Uh, I was extremely skinny. And it's really easy to get skinny on a fruitarian diet, but I'm also showing that you can also put on muscle on a fruitarian diet. It's, eating food isn't going to determine your muscle size. It's the, it's the stress that you put your muscles under that's going to determine that. So, so the question then might uh, come out from that is there is a bit of an argument sometimes towards uh, or, or the, 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 the debate is, is it better? Because obviously you're talking about longevity as well. Do you feel like eating less helps people live longer? Do you think it's worth yeah. the? Because I know that Robert Lockhart, that's kind of what he says or believes. Other people say, well, that makes sense if you're eating cooked food or bad food to eat less, but wouldn't have as much uh, impact for a fruitarian maybe. I don't know what you think about that. I definitely think that skinnier people live longer than fatter people. Sure. And if you're eating too much and you're overweight, you're just simply not going to live as long as if you're eating a little less and you were a little skinnier. And there's this, there's this, there's this fine line and that, that goes across and on one side of the line it's like, do you really want to uh, experience all these things in life or do you simply want to live the longest? Because if you simply, your goal is simply to live the longest, you want to be 137 years old, break the Guinness Book of World Records and be the live it, longest living human in history, then you're definitely going to have to live in somewhat of a bubble. And you're just not going to you know, risk certain things. You might not go on a certain hike in case you fall over and die. Um, I'm willing to, to risk my life doing certain things. I'm willing to jump you know, from building to building. I'm willing to do some handstands here and there. I'm willing to you know, go through the jungle and maybe get attacked by a tiger or something. I'm willing to swim in the ocean and maybe get attacked by a shark. I'm willing to die for an adventure. Um, and part of my adventure, part of the adventure I like to go on is to lift heavy weights and come home and eat enough food so that I can put on muscle at this stage of my life. When I become Robert Lockhart's age, maybe when I'm 67 years old, I'm not going to care about having bigger muscles. I'm not going to care about my fitness at all. All I'm going to care about is flexibility and breath work and meditation perhaps. So maybe by the time I hit age 60, I'm really going to laser and focus on, yeah, let's try and get to 120 years old or something like that. But at this stage, I'm 27, dude. I'm 26. I'm a bit young and reckless. I don't really care. <laughs> so what else are you working on at the moment? You, you, your people are probably quite. Um, but the people that come across you probably want to know more about your lifestyle because you're living in one place, you live in another place. You seem to do what you want. So what do you? Mm -hmm. What is it you work on? What's your daily life like? Do you have a schedule? Sure. Uh, well, something people want to know is how I make money. And I make money through three or four main main avenues. Um, one way I make money is I edit videos, editing videos for people. They send me the clips, I send them back the edited video, they send me the cash. And another way is to do coaching. So I do Skype coaching. People hop on a Skype call and we talk like this for an hour. It's mostly me asking them certain questions and then you know, answering back and then seeing how they can improve their life. Just success coaching, success mentoring, lifestyle mentoring, helping people transition to raw veganism, that sort of thing on Skype. And then another way is through selling ebooks, and another way is through um, another way is through speaking at these events. Mm -hmm. um, another way was um, in the in the past I was selling a bunch of fruit, I was buying wholesale and then selling wholesale. I no longer do that. And then another thing I did in the past was personal training. Um, meeting up with people in real life and doing personal training. I also do photography shoots with people now too. Yeah, I've seen that as well. Shoot some models, so that's yeah. fun. Yeah, um, you, you, you came under, I, I probably won't mention this too much, but I, I did see some videos where someone had uh, put you under a bit of criticism for um, what you were promoting in your life. <laughs> I haven't seen that video. I don't think I've seen it. I, I know you didn't. Yeah, I remember you telling me you didn't watch it. Um, but it was really, it was really weird to see. Obviously, that people maybe watch your videos and then they create an idea about you. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, and and oh, yeah, briefly, I, I forgot another another quick way to make money is just through ads on, on my YouTube videos. Um, so 
when, when people see all these videos I'm putting out, most of the videos I put out are about, you know, meditating, getting to bed early, eating fruit, getting some fitness in, and just having a positive mental attitude. These are like some topics I like to talk about. Yeah. And then every now and then, I put out a little more artsy video, maybe with some girls or some guys or whatever, and it's just not your average video. Um, and then people are like, well, this isn't like the, the Ted that I knew or whatever. And I'm a human being, I express myself in various ways. And when people meet me in real life, they see that I listen to like heavy metal or some rap music or something. They're like, oh, that's not the, the Ted I had imagined. Um, it's like, well, that's nice. Like, there's a lot, there's a lot more to me that I'm not going to show on YouTube all the time. Um, so, I just so happen to record certain things I put on YouTube. But um, yeah, it's I'm always trying to, I'm always trying to be new and evolve and grow into something else. So, more changes are coming. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, I mean. Uh... I think, I think what people don't get it as well as if, if someone's living in Chiang Mai, I know it's different different in Hawaii, because someone was saying to me, how do people, in, how are there all these vegans living in Chiang Mai? And you say, well, they, only, they don't really need that much money to, to be there. They, no. People are just saving up money and going out there for like six months, a year, two years yeah. even. They don't need that much cash to, to live out there if they want to. Yeah, you can, you can live with like four or five hundred bucks a month. Yeah, um, I was thinking as well, some other things that you've spoken about, um, you've spoken a lot on your channel about NoFap, and you've spoken about almost like the opposite of NoFap, like polyamory. So how does that all marry up? So, marry up, I like that marry up. Um, <laughs> polyamory allows you to, well, first of all, what is polyamory? Polyamory, definition of it is many loves. Amory meaning love and poly meaning many. Sure. So when you are when you say that you're polyamorous or when you act in accordance with polyamory, you allow yourself and you allow your partner to love whoever they want, whenever they want, however they want. All right. So however they want. That's a key. That's a key point there, Ronnie. I love you, right? But okay. I'm probably not going to be intimate with you. Maybe one day, but not right now. So that how is huge. So I'm allowed to go hang out with you, right? And if, if I had a whatever a girlfriend watching me hang out with you, she probably wouldn't be jealous, right? Because I'm just hanging out with Ronnie. So if you replace Ronnie now with another girl, a really beautiful girl, my girlfriend still shouldn't be jealous about me hanging out with you, right? It's just me hanging out with you, and I just so happen to love you as well. Um, now, if I happen to get intimate, whoop de doo What is intimacy? Intimacy is just another level of connecting, right? One level of intimacy is eye contact, another is holding hands, maybe hugging, maybe kissing on the cheek, maybe kissing on the lips, maybe giving a little hickey, moving down a bit, moving down a bit, going south, next thing you know, you're in. That's just different levels of um, connecting. And it's, at the end of the day, it's just sex. You know, there's people play acro yoga all the time, and then next thing you know from acro yoga, you go into the bedroom and you're, you're connecting on a deeper, intimate level, sure. Um, so polyamory just allows you to have the ability to do that with whoever you want, however you want. It doesn't mean that you're going to go do that all the time, though. Definitely not. In fact, when you're poly, you knowing that you at least have the ability to do that, almost, almost like shuts off your strong desire to do that. Now, what do I mean by that? I used to go for these long audiobook walks. Like first thing when I wake up, I go for a three-hour audiobook walk with no food. I'd be walking two and a half, two hours, two hours into the walk, I'd be like, "Oh my god, I really want some food." I'm like, "I'm kind of hungry now." I'd finally get home. I'd be like, "Oh my god, eat, 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 eat!" Finally, three hours I'm by, eat, 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 eat. But then I started carrying a banana with me. I always, and I had a banana with me during my three-hour walk. The whole three-hour walk, I was never hungry, so I knew I had that banana. It's there if I want it. So I'm like, "It's okay. I got it if I want it." So. Allowing yourself to do something sometimes um, allows you to succeed with actually not doing that. So in an exclusive relationship, when you, where you're not allowed to, to look at another woman or to be with another woman, it makes the guy or the girl kind of want to break free and, and, and uh, experience that, you know? So do you think that at the same time it's like have your cake, it's like the phrase, this is maybe not appropriate, but have your cake and eat it too, where it's like, I want to have my relationship and the stability of that, but I also want to have yeah. 
Yeah, yeah dude. Sure. Something else that usually doesn't come along. Sure. Releases, yeah. Everything is. is it, Why not? Does Why it, not? Does, does it work as well as that for you and your experience? Yeah. It 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 depends. So polyamory is not really widely accepted in our culture. So I'm yeah. one of the very few people I know who's practicing polyamory. There are very few people that I know practicing it. I know there are a lot of people practicing it, but very few people that I personally know who are practicing it. Um, and so a lot of the times I get into a relationship, I need to explain it to the girl. And the first time you hear about polyamory, the first time you practice polyamory, you it's not going to be as smoothly, not going to run as smoothly as like the fourth or fifth time you practice polyamory. Um, you just get better at it the more you practice it. Better at it in the sense that you don't feel jealous, you understand how to share, you understand like what kind of questions to ask, what kind of questions not to ask, what kind of ways to feel, etc., etc. Um, so, yeah, I seem to be less jealous when the girl I'm with is with someone else. Whereas the girl that I'm with seems to be a little bit more jealous when I'm with another girl. Um, and that's the way it's been in the past, at least. Anyway, because I simply have more experience with Polly than some of the girls I've been with. Um, but leading back to your initial question about NoFap, sure. and then how does that match up with polyamory, um, NoFap is about not blowing your load, not mastering, not blowing your load, not watching porn, for the most part. Um, so when you're not masturbating all the time, when you're not watching porn all the time, you stop associating women with sex, like just immediately like woman sex. And you start to see more of like the holistic beauty in the woman, more of like the, that, that feminine goddess in her, rather than just seeing her as an object for sex, and rather than seeing her as a way of getting off. So I'll still engage intimately with a woman, I'll still have sex with women, but I don't orgasm I don't finish and because I don't finish I'm approaching sex with a whole different attitude I'm approaching it with a whole another um, goal and the goal in mind is just to connect I'm not I'm not there to go boom 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 I explode I fall asleep I could do that in two minutes if I wanted but I'd rather just connect with the girl and connect with her um, for quite a bit long period of time and then just lay there and be with her afterwards rather than just fall asleep immediately after um, so that's how it's that to works. Hear. Yeah, no, it's good to hear. Good to hear your thoughts and all. Might that. be, might be TMI. Might be too much info for some people out there. But like I said, I'm 26, 27. I'm at this age, and I can. <laughs> I don't mind talking about this. I've talked about it on YouTube videos many times. But I'm sure there are people out there right now who say cringing. Do you think it helps the fact that you're on YouTube? Do you think do, you, do people feel like they already know you, kind of thing? It helps me express it because I've already expressed it. Sure. Ha having expressed it once allows me uh, to ha find it easier to express it again and again and again. Um, it's all confidence comes from exposure, successful exposure to something. So Brilliant. I've successfully gotten away with making YouTube videos about it. I can talk about it freely now. But um, but but it, I don't know if it helps the person listening. The person listening needs expo just as much exposure listening as I have expressing. So sure. Um, sure. We'll bring it back to the. Uh, where it all started, I suppose, with the with the diet and with raw veganism. In your time, can you tell me some of the big myths that you've heard that you've realized maybe aren't true, or things that you think is maybe dangerous information going around? What? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll I'll address one of them right at the bat, and this is like a big one because it's affected me personally. It's affected my friends personally. It's affected, yeah, my, everyone in the community really talks about it, and that is the teeth issue. People think that if you start eating fruit, your teeth are going to rot. And that's simply not true. My, my fruitarian dentist friend just left. He was here for three, four days, Joe. He's here. He's brushing his teeth three times a day. He's flossing his teeth eight to 12 times a day. Never had a cavity in his life. He's been fruitarian for a couple of years now. And uh, he's, he just mentions, he's like, you get cavities because you don't take care of your teeth, not because of what you're putting in your mouth and swallowing. Sure. What you put in your mouth and swallow doesn't have an eff doesn't have anywhere near as effect as much of an effect as your oral hygiene. Are you brushing? Are you flossing? Are you rinsing? How are you taking care of your teeth? People think that if you eat fruit, that you're gonna rot your teeth. But what typically happens? The reason fruitarians typically have worse teeth is because in general, fruitarians are more hippie-like. Fruitarians are more likely to be barefoot. 
more fraternians are more likely to not have their shirt on. Fraternians are more likely to be out in the sun all the time. Fraternians are much more likely to walk around naked under waterfalls. Fraternians are much more likely to copy other animals in nature. Because every other animal in nature eats raw food, fraternians think every other animal in nature doesn't brush their teeth. I'm not going to brush my, my teeth either. And I fell into the same camp. I was the same way. I was like, I'm not going to brush my teeth. And if I do brush my teeth, I'm not even going to use toothpaste. That's how naturally I'm going to take it. And then I started getting a few cavities. And I was like, oh crap, put on the brakes. I'm going to start brushing. And then got to brush some more. Got to use some floss. Now that I started brushing using floss, the cavities stopped coming. It's all about taking care of your teeth. So if you've got a cavity, I suggest getting it filled. But don't think that if you keep eating fruit, you're going to get more cavities. Just know that if you brush and floss several times a day, every single day, and take good care of your teeth, rinse between meals, your teeth are going to be fine. That's the biggest myth out there right now. Next to the, of course, the protein myth and, the, and things like that. Yeah, what do you think about supplementation, all that stuff? Do you do any of that? Are you worried about it? So something I've just recently started experimenting with, I'm not sure how long I'm going to carry on with it, but just recently started experimenting with, I started putting some hemp into my, my smoothies. Every now and then I'll put some hemp in, not even every single day. Um, but I've been speaking a lot with my friend who's into weightlifting big time here, he's vegan, and he's saying, he's like, Ted, like if you're lifting all these weights on a fruitarian diet and you add in some protein, your gains are going to be so much better. And I'm, he's convinced me, he talks about every single time. Like, all right, I'll go for it. So I'm just adding in some raw hemp powder to my smoothies. Um, it's boosting my protein uh, macro a little bit. Um, my digestion isn't impaired that much from it, so I'm like, it's all good. But I honestly think that if your goal is health and your goal is just to be at a really good fitness level, you don't need any supplementation unless you have the mentality that you do, you have the belief that you do, and your levels are coming up low then I know that if you start supplementing, your levels are going to go up. Your belief's going to be like, oh, thank God my levels are going up. So I'm supplementing. You're just going to be able to sleep better at night knowing that your levels are all good. It's a big mental game for sure. And placebos are legit. Yeah, absolutely. Because the yeah. power of placebo is so legit. But you mentioned something really interesting there because it's that fine line between the man-made and the natural. And the idea that natural is always better is what a lot of people maybe assume. And obviously with the diet, that's what we're looking to try and mm. have. But even things like, I was, I was on a forum today and a guy was saying, wild food is always better than cultivated. No, like wild fruits are always better than cultivated fruits. And I was thinking to myself, well, what do you actually mean by that? You know, what are you... How are you measuring? Are you saying that it tastes better? Are you saying it looks better? Are you saying it has... What What specifically do you mean? People just want to believe something that's wild and natural is just better. <laughs> it's just it's better. straight up better. Yeah. And you don't need any of this, any man-made stuff and, and all the rest of it. And uh, There's and pros yeah. and cons to everything. you got to realize that. There's pros and cons to everything. There's a pros and cons to a fruit diet. Yeah. But I, can, I can tell you the cons of a fruit diet as well, man. But yeah, I mean, a lot of the people who are online and on forums have never been to any of these festivals or events. They probably have never met a substantial amount of other raw vegans to actually share their history or share their story mm -hmm. with. And you kind of think, where are you getting this information? You know, they're just getting information from, I don't know, old books and things that don't sure. really have, that no one's really verified and stuff like that. So I don't know. It's, it's, it's something. Um. We're coming up to festival season in the next few months. Um, Woodstock, the Danish festival you're going to be at. Uh, you're I'll be at the Danish the festival, yep. I'll be at the UK fest. I'll be at the Woodstock Fruit Festival. Those, they're the three main ones. Mm -hmm. So yeah. tell, us, uh, tell, us, uh, tell us a little bit about Woodstock, firstly, as, uh, as what's your history with that? Well, yeah, it's the first festival I ever attended. It was an absolute dream come true. I felt like... It was around that time when Woodstock came out that I first realized that, like, I'm the creator of my own reality. And all I was focusing on at that point was just fruit, 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 community, community, community. I wrote down on paper, like, I live in a community of like-minded fruitarians. I was just visualizing what that would look like. Then, like, a couple months later, Mike Arnstein releases this announcement saying, hey, we're going to have a, the Woodstock Fruit Festival, and Dan McDonald's going to be there, Doug Graham's going to be there, Freely's going to be there, Harley's going to be there. And my jaw hit the floor. I can't believe it. Sign me up now. 
pay whatever it costs. Just get me there. I'm pretty sure I paid it on Visa. I couldn't even afford it. I was like, let's just go into debt on this. Let's just get there. Um, so I showed up, and it was an absolute dream come true. And um, I've been every year since except one. One year I missed because I was in Thailand. Uh, it had just arrived in Thailand. I wasn't going to fly back to New York for just a, a week. But um, it would have been worth it. Had I flown back from Thailand just for that week, it would have been worth it. Woodstock Fruit Festival been the best week of my life every single year in a row. Best seven days in a row. Um, it's amazing, man. I even went for that two-week festival one year. Can you imagine that? The Woodstock doubled it up one year. It went 14 yeah. days. Yeah. That was a long 14 days, man. But um, <laughs> it, was a, it was a really special time. Best best time spent, for sure. That's, uh, to me, these events are like, these. they're really special right now. Maybe they're going to get bigger. Maybe they're going to stop. Who knows? And I just think that anyone that's missing out on them right now that isn't going, uh, whichever one, and I know I've got a vested interest because I run a festival, but yeah. the only reason I started it was because I enjoyed, like yourself, I, I love being at them. <laughs> so I wanted to give back, but um, hearing you talk about it excites me. You know, I, it just reminds me of what it's like and how powerful it is, and it is just the best place on earth to be is at one of these events <laughs> for some reason I don't sometimes I don't even understand exactly why but just the people and the atmosphere and um, the, even the information I love I love the information as well like the exchange of knowledge and the different people that come and share something yeah you you the quality of your life is there, I mean there, the, the quality of your relationships reflects the quality of your life when you're at these festivals Everyone is your best friend. Your quality of relationships at these festivals, you're either best friends with someone or you're madly in love with someone there. Like, there's those two spectrums of people there. Your best friends are the people you're actually in love with. And everyone you interact with, it's like they lift you up and you're lifting them up. And you sit back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. By the end of the festival, you're so freaking high. that The danger of these festivals, Ronnie, you should maybe put a warning somewhere on your website, warning people of the danger, is that when you leave the festival, you will be extremely sad. <laughs> you will be sad to leave, and you might even go into a little bit of depression for a day or two, just having left your family and everyone you love. Like When you're at the festival, I asked, I asked a question last year. I spoke at Woodstock, and, and you can ask. I said, can I see a raise of hands? Who wants to leave this festival at the end of the day, at the end of the week? Nobody put up their hand. Not a single hand was raised. People do not want to leave the festival. They want to stay. And so when the, when that day comes to leave, people are like, "Why am I leaving? Why do we have to go? Like this is stupid. Let's just stay." You know? Um, it's like they're starting. They, next thing you know, they'll be picketing with protest signs. We're staying. Uh, so. There's, there's that definitely that post festival dip that you experience because the high is real. You really, you really do get high at these festivals. You get so high at these festivals from the communication between um, the people that you're with that you don't really need to eat that much food. I eat way less food. If I'm normally eating 3,000 calories a day at these festivals, I'm probably eating 1,500 calories a day, and I feel great. You lose weight coming to these festivals not because you're eating fruit, but because you're hardly eating anything. <laughs> Yeah, no, these are, I, I think they're really special, whichever one. I, there's also an event, in, uh, there's a, a festival in Spain as well to mention to people. Um, I'm trying to think, of, there might be some other. There is a raw vegan festival in Sweden that is not quite the same thing, but there's, okay. there's a few other places that there's raw events. I think there's actually Austin Fruit Festivals going on right now. Yes, 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 yes. Austin, yes. Uh, if people yes. are in Austin. Then, Austin Fruit Fest with Chang, with uh, Connor and Brittany. Yeah, with Connor and Brittany, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, okay, brilliant. Um, last and then I, I, I just want to mention something too. I just recently um, started brainstorming with my friend Andy, uh, Andrea Page. She's this holistic healer, beautiful woman from Bali. And uh, her and I are actually putting on a three-day workshop in Amsterdam between the Danish Fresh Fruit Festival and the UK Festival. That little weekend in between. I think it's oh. July... 28th, 29th, and 30th, the three-day little workshop seminar there. Fantastic. So for people who want to come um, and just immerse themselves for three days in Amsterdam with myself and Andy and just focus on health, fitness, relationships, then that's the place to come. Well, there's, there's definitely a, an 8 to 10 uh, community out, or 
uh, raw vegan community out there as well. So there's definitely been a number of people that have been interested from there. Um, yeah, so the UK Fruit Festivals, I just want to mention that it's the 2nd to the 6th of August. And if you want to come and Ted's the person that you're coming to see and meet and he's the person that inspired you, then there is a discount code attached to his Come Fruit Yourself. And if you want to register and come to the festival, you can go to fruitfest.co.uk slash registration and you'll get a significant discount um, with Ted's code. And we'll even make it, uh, if you sign up in seven days after this video gets put up, we'll make it an even better discount for everyone. So cool. Even more. So if anyone wants to take advantage of that and, and you're coming to see Ted, and uh, I, I just want to say to anyone who's... Uh, only met Ted online or seen his videos on Ted uh, online. Um, uh, that Ted really played a huge part in the festival last year and was uh, was uh, really important to the whole thing. And a lot of people were very impressed by his not just his talks, but how much he put into it, how much he helped people, how many questions he answered, and and so on. So. He's the real deal. So thanks a lot for <laughs> being part of it. You're running. Um, what are you doing in the future? What's happening next? I know you've got a, a lot of things you're working on. Got a lot of things I'm working on. Um, I guess the big thing now is just like I, I want to put together an amazing video, amazing movie, maybe perhaps a documentary, put together some short films, and just focus on filmmaking as well. I'm working on this app right now, an app that's going to bring people together in real life or on Skype if they want to meet on Skype instead, but the purpose of coming together for teaching and learning things. So bringing together people who want to learn something with the people who actually want to teach it. Specific things like how to start your own fruit festival or how to eat a fruitarian diet or how to use how to use one of these cameras. Like just specific things, yeah. bring people together so they can teach and learn from one another. So and it's, it's a fun. great idea because it just that's sometimes what you need is just someone. It's, it's, you can you can look on Google, you can look on YouTube, mm -hmm. but if you have someone that's there with you, you can answer. You can get very quickly the questions answered. That you can get going with it. It's much more, much more natural, dude. Way more natural for you to point or hold my hand and tell me exactly where to go, rather than googling something and reading instructions. I personally suck with instructions. I love an example someone can set for me. So that's what this app is all about. Fantastic. Uh, Brilliant, Ted. I look forward to seeing you in a few months' time. Um, yeah, yeah. Everyone, get to get to one of the festivals, support them. Whether it doesn't have to be UK Fruit Fest, but um, there's a number of events around the world, and getting together with people, sharing ideas, and then starting to spread it around the world, and and spreading it and sharing it to other people. That's the only way that this message, this movement, is going to get out there. Yeah, and yeah. make this world a much better place for everyone. It's uh, it is important. If if you're out there, you don't have a purpose in your life. There's a purpose right there to try and spread yeah, more yeah. of this information. <laughs> uh, I, think, I, I just want to say, Ronnie, the last thing here before we go, that I've met the love of my life at these fruit festivals. I've met the best friends I have now at these festivals. The house I'm living at right now is because of the people I've met at the festival. Like a direct invite when I was at these festivals. Hey, come live in Hawaii. Like, I wouldn't be who I am right now staring at this webcam if I had not gone to these festivals. Yeah. Period. End of the story. Easy, simple. Go to these festivals, your life will change 100%. Yeah, if you, if you want to have, I mean, the reason I have a friendship with Ted, the reason I have a friendship with so many people that we know in common, and I know a lot of the people that you're staying with, and we know a lot of people in common. The only reason we have a friendship with all those amazing people and the brilliant, fantastic people is because we went to these, we both went to these events and went to because we bought again. the ticket. <laughs> What's that? Because we bought the ticket. That's it. Yeah, and committed to go and become part of it. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. It's great cool. to speak to you again. And um, everyone check out Ted at Fruit Living on YouTube and Fruit Living on the uh, website as well, .co.com, sorry, fruitliving.com. Yeah, uh, yep. tedcar.ca, the Ted new Car. and approved. Fantastic. Cool. Um, All right, man. Yeah, so share this video with other people, and uh, thanks a lot for watching, everyone. Bye, bye. Peace.